Hi, Tony DeWitt here, Missouri Appellate Attorney and a guy who likes to make the law make sense on YouTube. Today we're going to talk about the closings in the Scott Peterson case, and I'll have more on that in just a moment. I have to apologize because I can't seem to download the video today of the closings. So I'm just going to talk based on what I saw and tell you what I think. Um, and I have a prediction as to how this is going to come out, so we'll just have to see if I'm right. The case involves, if you're not familiar with it, it involves a school resource officer who basically did nothing for 48 minutes while children were being slaughtered at uh, Douglas, um, I guess it's Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in, um, or just outside of Coral Gables. It's in Broward County, Florida. The school resource officer is the, name, is the guy by the name of Scott Peterson, and he's on trial, and he's charged with three things. One of them is child neglect, because he's been labeled as a caregiver. That will probably be tested on appeal culpable negligence, and he's also been charged with perjury for lying to the investigating officers about his role uh, in the actions following the, uh, the original shooting. What the state has to prove are the elements of those offenses. And the closings work this way. The first thing that happens is the prosecution gets up and makes a case, make, lays out all of the elements, and says all these things have been proved. The defense comes up and tries to create reasonable doubt by pointing out the testimony that's favorable to the defense here. And then the state gets a chance to come back and rebut all of that with its rebuttal closing argument. Now, this happens in every lawsuit, even even civil cases. The plaintiff gets to go first and last, and in a criminal trial, the state gets to go first and last. And that is because they have the burden of proof. So for that reason, they get to have a second bite at the apple on closing argument. Closing arguments come down to several things. One of them is personality. One of them should be and always is the facts in the case. The other is emotion. So if you have somebody who is a captivating personality and they discuss the facts in a coherent way and they produce a level of emotion necessary to uh, do the job for either the plaintiff or the defendant, then the person who does the best job in all three of those things will usually wind up winning at trial. Not always, but usually. Now, <clears throat> in this case, the state went first with its closing argument, and the young lady who did the closing argument, in my opinion, came off whiny. Uh, she did a workmanlike job of going through the evidence, but when she would get emotional, in, instead of sounding uh, passionate about what she was doing, she sounded, uh, I don't know, tinny. It's like she couldn't get the right emotional note in her speech to the jury. In that what she should have come off with is, you know, nobody wants to prosecute a police officer, but nobody wanted to see these kids get killed. And, you know, this is a tough job, but I've got to do it and lay out things. But it really seemed like she was enjoying what she was doing. And I don't think that was possibly the best way to go about this. Now, you may have had a different opinion. I would urge you to go and watch the full closings from both the state and the defense. But that's how she came off to me. Now, I do think she hit all of the right evidence and, and definitely made the case that they had proved the elements of the crime. The problem here is not whether they've proved the elements of the crime. The problem for them is really going to be 
how good a job the defense does at creating reasonable doubt. Now, I made the statement early on that I thought that the defense attorney here was very good at what he was doing because every time the state would put points on the board with evidence in this trial, the defense would come back in and on cross-examination they would get in their evidence too. You know, the, some of the police officers who were cross-examined, well, you know, you would agree with me that sometimes you can't tell where shots are coming from. Now, I think that was handled pretty well in this case on rebuttal, but nonetheless, that is one of the things that you sometimes that, that they did. They every every time the prosecution scored points on rebuttal or on cross examination, the defendants would get a few of their points scored as well. In short, in the personality issue, I think he had a better personality. I think he definitely connected with the jurors and he made reasonable sounding arguments, ask the reasonable questions that I think jurors would want to know the answers to. So I think I would give him an A-plus for his defense in this case, at least to date. With that understanding, I felt like she needed to do more than merely tap on the door with getting the elements presented to the jury. I felt like she needed to establish an emotional connection and explain why this is such an important case. And I just don't think that that part of her closing argument resonated. It didn't resonate with me, I'll put it this way. So then the defense gets up and they start going through all of the evidence that was favorable to them. And the one thing that they didn't really do is address the elements. One of the things that they talked about was how difficult it was to know where the shots were coming from and you know it was reasonable under the circumstances to wait for better information because you know fools rush in and all of that and again i think the defense attorney here did a good job he did a good job of poking holes in the state's case but not in the elements of the state's case in other words he made it seem like this was an unfair attack on a poor school resource officer and you know, there is an old adage at trial that says, if the facts are on your, your side, you pound the facts. And if the law is on your side, you pound the law. And if neither the facts nor the law are on your side, then you just pound the table. And it seemed to me that in the closing, he was doing a lot of table pounding. Again, I think he's a very effective lawyer. So then the state got up to do its rebuttal closing. Now here is one of the things that happened during the state's rebuttal closing is Scott Peterson, the camera is on him, and he has to slap his attorney and say, hey, you need to object to that because the prosecutor was apparently saying things that the evidence didn't bear out. So the lawyer made the objection. He knew it was going to be overruled, and the judge basically said, hey, jury, it's up to you to remember the evidence. I'm not going to tell you that that was wrong. I'm going to say you need to remember the evidence. And they do that so that, you know, the, the jury does remember the evidence. So the, the, on the rebuttal closing, the gentleman prosecutor got up. And he did say, you know, look, I don't want to be here. I don't want to be prosecuting a cop. But there has to be accountability here. And the first thing he did was attack the defense by saying, look, we don't have to prove all the things the defense told you about. We have to prove the elements of the crime. And here are the elements of the crime. You're going to get this back in the, in the jury instructions. And you're going to see that we've proved the elements of the crime. And what that means is we don't have to prove where the shots were coming from. We have to prove that he didn't do what he was trained to do and what he should have done. And in this situation, I think he had a very strong emotional appeal that he made a logical appeal. You've got vulnerable students in this building. They are required by state law to be there. Their attendance is mandatory. And they have a school resource officer to protect them. And that school resource officer's job is to 
get in there and stop the bloodshed if there is an active shooter. And that is exactly what did not happen here. And over and over and over again, he went back to the idea that Scott Peterson did nothing for 48 minutes. He played on his radio. And numerous times he said he ran. He ran away from the 1200 building instead of running into it. Now, when I was a kid, there was a television show on that starred Chuck Connors. And Chuck Connors was an unfairly accused officer in the U.S. Army who was accused of cowardice under fire. And they threw him out of the Army and they broke his sword and he ran around throwing that sword for like the next 16 episodes of the show until he was finally proven innocent and the show ended. But what was interesting to me about that is there was a little blurb, a little song that they sang that said, Branded marked as the one who ran, what do you do when you're branded and you know you're a man? That was the entirety of what I remember of that show. And essentially, what the prosecutor was doing is he was saying, this guy's a coward, he ran, he didn't do his job, and over and over again, both prosecutors said he put his life ahead of the lives of all those people in the building. And, you know, the priorities are the hostages, the students, and then, you know, the police officer and the shooter. That's the priority. You have to save those people in that order. And in this particular case, he did not go into that building and stop the gunfire. One of the things that they made clear is he doesn't have to get into a gunfight with this guy who has better firepower than he does. What he has to do is go in there and assert himself because once he shows up as an armed individual, then there is a threat to this shooter and he's going to stop what he's doing in order to run away. And anytime he stops and runs away, that's good for the students, which I think was an excellent thing to do. The point being made over and over was simply that doing nothing is not an option. And making all of the other officers stay 500 feet back was a bad decision. Not so much because they weren't going to catch the shooter. They had, the shooter had already left by the time the other officers arrived. The issue was you had wounded students in there who needed medical aid. And it may not necessarily be obvious, but almost every police officer carries a med kit or has access to a med kit. And the med kit has a tourniquet on it. And a tourniquet is a very powerful weapon in a mass shooting because what tends to kill people is blood loss. And that's from, you know, you can have a leg wound. You know, you can hit, be hit in the knee. Your popliteal artery is behind your knee. If that artery is severed, you're going to bleed out in between 6 and 10 minutes. And that's even if you put direct pressure on it. Even if you're strong enough to hold pressure on your wound, um, you're still going to have a lot of blood loss from that wound. And so by not getting officers in there to help assess and provide emergency first aid, triage those kids who'd been wounded, he contributed to the deaths of several of those kids who essentially bled out after that shooting. So those were the points that were made in the rebuttal closing. And he finished strong. He did a very strong emotional closing argument. And I thought it went very, very well. So how does this end? Well, that's a good question. I thought it was fairly close. Um, the defense essentially said, look, go back there, read the instructions, and then vote, and then acquit this guy and send him home. And... I'm sure that would be a lovely way for um, the jury to uh, violate their oath because the oath requires them to deliberate. But the the point that he was making is this is nonsense. You know, don't 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 convict my guy because he he just did what anybody else would do. Except he's not anybody else. He is a sworn officer of the law, and he had an obligation and a duty to go in there and take this guy on, and he didn't do that. 
And I think that is where the strength of the case is for the state. Now, there are only six people on this jury, and all he has to get is one of those six. The defense has to get only one of those six, and he's got a hung jury. If he gets all six, then he's got an acquittal. But it has to be unanimous one way or the other. It either has to be unanimous for conviction or unanimous for acquittal. Now, the jury also has lesser included offenses, and so they can uh, they can convict him of uh, child neglect without injury, child neglect with injury. They can and, uh, convict him of uh, culpable negligence, and they can convict him of perjury. They might convict him of perjury and let him off on the other two, uh, which relate to his job performance. They, there are a number of things that the jury could do here. And it, it really, uh, one of the unfair things, I think, is that they sort of threw the book at him. And I'm not certain they would have done that, but for the fact that, you know, in this particular case, it's a pretty emotional thing in Broward County. And I, I think also you've got this issue of, was he unfairly targeted, you know, because the governor made a big issue of this. Who knows? The long and short of it is that the jury is going to reach a decision in this, but I don't think they're going to reach it quickly. I think what's going to happen is they're going to de they're going to deliberate over three to four days, and it really comes down to who the four person is and how that four person runs the deliberations. Because if you get somebody who is pro defense, it could be over pretty quickly, four or five hours. If you get somebody who is, uh, you know, a fan of the state, it could go a lot longer. And as long as they're deliberating, even if they get, even if they get deadlocked, you know, three for acquittal, three for conviction, even if that happens, the judge will tell them to go back and deliberate some more. He's not going to let them or you know, declare a mistrial for probably. You know, he's probably going to make them go two to three days before he's going to declare a mistrial, if there is one to be declared. So how do I think this is going to come out? I think after two or three days, you're going to get an acquittal. And I, I think that's just going to come from the steady wearing down of whoever might be in favor of voting for conviction. Um, and the reason that I think that is not because I think Peterson did a good job or his conduct was laudable. I think the reason you're going to get that is because the whole case is a stretch in some ways, this child neglect thing. The child neglect statute was never meant to apply to a sheriff's officer. I think everybody understands that. Now, the perjury statute, they might get a conviction on. But the other stuff, I don't think they're going to get a conviction on just because I think the defense was so effective in getting its information up in front of the jury. Now, again, one thing that is an unknown here is whether or not any of those people on the jury were personally affected by what happened at, um, at trial or at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, or if they knew somebody, or if they have an ax to grind. And that can also change the dynamic. But my prediction is that there will be an acquittal. So that's what I have for you today. I, I wish I had time to download the other, but I'm in a location where I don't have good internet access and I don't have good bandwidth because every other single person in the free world has apparently decided to converge on Destin this week. And as a result, uh, I have the bandwidth basically of a 300 baud telephone modem. So. Um, suffice it to say, I'm not going to have a good time uploading this video later on. But I will go back to uh, looking at this trial later on, uh, probably Wednesday, after I get back to Auburn. <clears throat> so, thank you. so thank you very much for watching. I appreciate all of your uh, attention, and I appreciate your gracious uh, allowing me to... Uh, go down to uh, the land of the giant rat and visit with Mickey. And uh, hopefully we'll not be doing a lot of that the rest of the summer and we'll be making videos and looking at some interesting things. And again, as I put out in the short the other night, if you have a video you want made, send me an email. 
aldewitt7 at gmail.com. Up in the title or the subject line, put video request and then tell me what video you want in the body of the message. Thanks so much for watching. Have a marvelous day. If you like this video, here are a few others you might try, and don't forget to subscribe. Have a terrific day, guys.